All right, hello again, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well. Uh, in, in today's video lecture, uh, this will be a kind of a shorter one, I just want to um, start to show you strategies using the punctual live coding language for working with photographic materials. Uh, and the reason why I think this is such a useful strategy for you, for those of you that choose to do visual live coding projects, is that working with photographic materials um, is just another way of making these projects more distinctive and original because we can work with our own photographic material um, that we've captured with our own cameras and it, it gives us another way of, of putting our media work um, yeah, into the project, another layer to the project. So um, just as in the lecture yesterday, I have fired up the punctual environment in my Chrome web browser by going to dktr0.github.io slash punctual. And I'm greeted with the example program here, which I'm going to erase. Um, so before getting to um, photographic materials, um, there's an, a few other things we should talk about first on the way there. So um, I'm going to type a different example program than the one I started with yesterday. And this one, this first example, is going to look like this. And when I evaluate that, I get this white, gray to white band that appears across the right side of the screen. And so I want to explain how this um, little program is working. fx is equivalent to how far across the screen we are in the x dimension. Um, and it goes from minus 1 to 1. So when we're all the way over here on the left, fx is minus 1. And as we move to the right here, it's moving up to zero, and then it'll be zero in the middle of the screen. And then from here to the right edge of the screen, it's moving from zero up to one. And as it does that, we're seeing the screen get brighter. Now I want to show you a different example program, but same idea. This one's going to say FY instead of FX. And when I evaluate that, now we see something similar but different. It's dark in the bottom half of the screen. And then in the top half of the screen, it's gradually getting brighter. Uh, so Fy is like Fx, except in the y dimension. So it starts at minus 1, and it moves towards 0. And then from 0, it moves towards 1. And as it goes from 0 to 1, we see um, some brightness here. Um, so in both of these cases, I'm going to change it back to the FX one. In both of these cases, we're um, generating a number and we're assigning that number to our visual output. And the number that gets generated is different depending on where we are on the screen. And the reason this works is that under the hood, behind the scenes, what's really happening here is that we're making what is called a fragment shader. And possibly the people um, who maybe play a lot of video games have heard this term. A fragment shader is a little program that is responsible for drawing on surfaces, for example, in fancy 3D games. And here in front of us in the punctual environment, we have a big rectangle. That's the surface that we're drawing on with this fragment shader. So when we assign FX, via these double arrows here to RGB, what's happening is that's getting translated into millions of little programs, uh, a different one for each pixel of the screen, and FX will have a different value for each pixel on the screen, and then that value is becoming the color of that pixel on the screen. And because it's just a single value, it's becoming the red, green, and blue of that pixel on the screen, and that's why we're getting this um, um, transition from from black through gray to white. So we could do something like this instead. So I'm making a three channel signal and I'm assigning this three channel signal to RGB. And normally I would just evaluate this and, and see what the result is, but let's think a little bit about 
what we might expect to see, which is another way of thinking about these things. The first channel here is going to be um, is going to control the red redness of our output, and so it's going to get redder as things get closer to the right side of the screen. And this second channel is going to control the green, so it's going to get greener as we go higher on the screen. And this third channel, which is zero, controls the blue. So there's not going to be any blue anywhere. There's zero blue. So what's that going to look like? Let's evaluate it now. So see, we get the screen that gets greener as we go up, redder as we go right, and of course we get a yellowy mix when we go up and to the right here. What if we wanted to flip these things? Um, we could multiply any of them by minus one. If I take fx and I multiply it by minus one, which I should put in brackets, then the green is going to be, uh, sorry, the red is going to be on the other side instead. And I could do the same thing for the green to put it on the bottom. Uh, and just as um, something fun, what if we put fx times fy in the blue channel? And we get a bit of a blue circle in the upper right corner. A program like this actually used to be something like the demonstration program of Punctual, maybe about a year a year ago. Um, so we can do fun things with this if we start combining it with motion, um, with sine oscillators, like we saw the other day. What if I'm going to go back to a blank program again? What if instead of making FX how bright the screen was, so that things are a certain brightness or not depending on where where they are, what if we make the brightness dependent upon motion that depends on where you are? Uh, it's easier to do it than talk about it, to be honest with you. Let's just do it. What kind of things do we get? So now we start to get these interference patterns. So basically what we're, what we're seeing looks like moving stripes. Um, but what we're actually asking for with the code here is we're asking for each the brightness of each pixel to be um, flashing in and out according to a sine wave whose frequency is higher when you're closer to the edges of the screen. And you can kind of see that um, if you watch this. Like if you look at the left and right edges of the screen, it looks like things are moving faster. And then as your eye goes towards the center of the screen, it tends to look like things are moving slower. That's in fact what's happening. So we're not asking for these bands, but we're getting them anyway. And that's another example, I think, of, of emergence. We could do this um, in multiple channels. What if we put sine Fy on the green channel and zero on the blue channel again? And now we start to get interference patterns in different dimensions. And we can start to explore and get interesting results just by making these expressions more complicated. So if instead of Fx, I have in brackets fx times fx. Now we have a more complicated pattern, a more complicated interference pattern of those red vertical lines. I'm going to make this one fy times fx, and we're going to start to get, I think, some circular, circular patterns. That's pretty. And the fun thing about these um, patterns is that you have to watch them for a very long time sometimes for them to repeat. I guess this one repeats every couple of seconds or so. But you'll find as you play with it and explore it yourself and make more complicated things that it's easy to make patterns that take a long, very long time before they, before they repeat. So the reason that, um, I mean, I think this is what we just have seen with these interference patterns and sine oscillators combined with Fy and Fx is an interesting way of getting um, geometric 
uh, interference patterns on the screen. But the other reason that I wanted to show it to you is to get somewhat used to this concept of Fy and Fx as representing a position on the screen. Um, the way that this fragment shader works is that every frame of the animation, every pixel is redrawn by this program. Um, but the actual copy of the program is going to have a different value for Fx and Fy depending on where it is when it's running. So that's how this is working. The reason I wanted to show you this is to get you used to FY and FX, because when we move to talking about photographic textures, we will find that that is useful there as well. So I'm going to evaluate nothing to blank it out. And now um, we're going to move to seeing what we have to do to work with photographic textures in this language. And it's uh, as it happens, uh, you really need to use a photographic texture that is available on the web. Um, if you want to use your own photo, you'll have to upload it to uh, an available web location somehow, which um, could be um, something like a, a Google Drive that you have at your disposal, um, or a Mac Drive, or some kind of other cloud service. You'll just have to make sure that you have a publicly shareable link or URL for the image that you're working with. So I'm going to go to Wikimedia Commons and use a Creative Commons image for today's demonstration. They always have nice photos here. Oh, I like that one. It's nice and symmetrical. So we're looking up at the, at the roof of a, um, a cathedral in Spain. Let's click on that. Uh, and let's click on that again. And now the browser is only displaying that JPEG file. If I look at the long URL here, um, up in the top of my browser, in the end I can see that it's a JPEG file, not an HTML file or some other type of file. So we're really just looking at this file. We're just looking at this publicly available file using the browser. So that's the URL I want. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy all of that to the clipboard. And I'm going to go back to Punctual. And I'm going to write text. And then in quotation marks, I'm going to put that URL. It's really long. And then um, after that, in square brackets, I'm going to put FX and FY, which we saw a few minutes ago. And so what this expression that I've written so far is going to do is it's going to access the color information from that file at the indicated locations. And since the locations are fx and fy, we're just, lo we're just accessing the image at the corresponding location that we're currently drawing on the screen. And so I'm going to access that, and then I'm going to assign it to RGB so that we see it. And that's it. And what I'm hoping to see when I evaluate this is the image, um, perhaps stretched a little bit to fill the canvas of the browser here. And sure enough, it works. Um, yay, we, dis we displayed the image. So now I can start to play with it. For example, one thing I could do would be to mask it. If I was to take this image and I was to multiply it by a rectangle that was at the middle of the screen and which was um, two units wide but only 0.1 units high, that would look like this. So let's talk a little bit about this result again. So um, the first part of our expression here, that what, what I will call the texture from now on, um, is numbers between 0 and 1 for the red, green, and blue channel of this image file that we found on the internet. And then the second part of our expression, the rectangle at 0, 0, with a width of 2 and a height of 0.1, is also numbers between 0 and 1, um, except they're all zeros or 1s. Like when we're not in the rectangle, it's a 0. When we are in the rectangle, it's a 1. And so when we multiply those two sets of numbers um, between 0 and 1, whenever either of them is 0, we get nothing. So for example, when we're not in the rectangle, we get nothing. Uh, and whenever both of them are something, we get the product of, of that. So when the rectangle is 1, we that's, we get just whatever is coming from the texture. So we can start to play with this by having the rectangle move, for example. What if the position of the rectangle 
instead of always being zero, zero, um, what if its Y position was a slow moving sine oscillator, a sine oscillator at 0.1 Hertz? That's gonna look like this. It's gonna be like we're scanning through the image. So we could do this in sync with music um, or we could just do it for its own sake. Um, either way would be good. What if we also made the X position of the rectangle move with another slow sine oscillator? Now we get this kind of moving slat that is scanning the image, almost like a moving window, or uh, I guess the opposite of a curtain. Now we might have some fun stuff if we add some feedback to this, like we did yesterday. Saturates out a little bit. So we could imagine building up a live coding performance around these kind of techniques. Maybe we would start by displaying, for example, a tiny part of the image and then we would start to make it move. And then maybe we would make it more intense or we would add more complexity. And then maybe we would start to take things apart and um, fade out. That could be a simple structure for a performance um, in this, uh, in, for a visual only live coding performance. Um, so let's, uh, let's start to make it more complicated then. Let's take that next step. Um, so what if I want to access this texture and do multiple things with it. Um, it's gonna be a real pain to have to repeat this whole line here with the URL every time. So what I'm gonna do to make that more simple is I'm gonna assign the texture to a letter T and I'm gonna put a semicolon on the end of that. And so now having done this in this first line here, what I'm saying is that later on I can just use T to mean all of all of this. T will mean all of this stuff that I've highlighted here. And so I should get the same result then if I put T times a rectangle here. And I'm gonna evaluate, and sure enough, it looks the same. So now um, I'm gonna take our texture and multiply it by another shape. What if we have another rectangle um, moving at a different speed, and I'm just making this up as I go on, that has a different size. Maybe this rectangle is really, really narrow in the X dimension, but very high. So it's kind of like the opposite rectangle of the first one. And all of these lines are separated by semicolons now. And you see, I didn't have to, even though I'm using the texture twice, even though I'm using the image twice, I didn't have to, to retype all of this ugly code here. I just, I've assigned it to T, and so now I can use T here. So I'm gonna evaluate that, and we should see two lines now. And we're getting that video feedback, the, the delayed colors from the previous frame still is affecting both of them. So this is the basic idea of um, working with textures or image files, photographic images uh, in Punctual. And I mean, all the rest of it is, is really to play with it. Um, and so I'm gonna take one last step uh, for today, which is to make our work fade away. We saw that in the previous lecture. And to do a nice fade out, I'm gonna go to both of our lines where we're actually drawing the texture is um, masked by rectangles, and I'm gonna put a 20 second crossfade time on them, and then I'm gonna delete the code that I have there and just replace it with zero, like no color. So they're both zero, and now I'm gonna evaluate, and we're gonna see a fade out to zero over 20 seconds. I'll just wait for it. Things are getting darker, so gradually.
and there we go. So we had, you know,